this. No reading without the phone. I don't know how to explain it to you folks. So wow. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Well, it's, uh, that sounded like an AA meeting, didn't it? <laughs> and John. I started reading when I was two. Nobody said it was a problem. <laughs> then the next thing I knew, I was writing, and people tried to make me stop, but it didn't work, and I kept doing it. Now I'm here, so well done, me. <laughs> I'm very excited. I'm gonna actually yeah, push move this forward a yeah. little bit because yeah. <laughs> my bookshelf really likes me. <laughs> That's much better. Uh, thank you for coming out on a Sunday at 4 p.m. That's just, it's just that, so I'm doing a couple of, don't feel bad for me, okay? <laughs> but we're doing the, for the last couple of tours, I was uh, doing like Monday, Friday, and then I would get to come home and spend the, the weekends at home and then go out again. But this tour, we scheduled both the, the Saturday uh, and the Sunday because, and again, don't feel bad for me, I have to go to Budapest next week. Right? Oh. I know, it's so horrible, right? Yeah. So, so the reason I'm going to Budapest, this is, the, this is hilarious to me, hilarious and kind of awesome, but mostly hilarious, is that I am the guest of honor at the Budapest International Book Festival, right? Thank you, thank you. And like earlier this year, they're like, hey, well, would you like to come and be the guest of honor at the Budapest International Book Festival, here are some of our previous guests of honor. And the person who was the guest of honor last year was like a Nobel Prize winner in literature. <laughs> but, and the other people that they were listed were like, uh, you know, Umberto Eco and Salman Rushdie <laughs> and Jonathan Franzen and Paul Quelo. And so like when I was like, did somebody die? <laughs> Am I like the last minute replacement? I mean, I will take the gig if you if you want me to, but it but it feels like you know it's like who do we have? Who's around? Go ask Scalzi, you know. And it turned out that that's not what was going on. What was actually going on was that they were wanting to sort of expand their uh, range of guests of honor, and my local publisher there. Um, was like, oh, we have just the guy. Because I'd been in Budapest before um, for a, another event, and so they knew that one, they knew who I was and they'd seen me in action. They knew that I was at least reasonably socialized, you know? Because <laughs> with authors, you never know. I mean, do ya? Uh, and then, uh, and, so, and, and also, this was like, when the email came to my agent, because my agent show, showed it to me, it was like literally just like, this has never happened to us before and it will never happen again. Please, please make him say yes. I don't know what it is, but make him say yes. And, uh, it's just the feeling of they're like, this is such a good thing for us. And I'm like, no guilt, no guilt. It's just our, our entire company is writing on you. Uh, uh, okay, but I had to talk to Tor because you know, it actually cut in because the book came out last Tuesday, and so we had to like make arrangements. So we started the tour actually a day early. We usually started on Tuesdays. We started on Monday. I'm doing the weekend. Uh, I go I go to Cincinnati tomorrow, uh, and my wife's going to come down and see my event. <laughs> We're going to exchange luggage. <laughs> And I know, right? It's like, guess what I have in this suitcase for you? It's dirty clothes. Yeah. <laughs> and then off I go, off I go to Budapest. And it sounds so jet set, and yet it's just, you know, it's just me. Um, and it's been, it's been a really good tour so far, except that one day. Yeah. yeah I don't know if all of you know. No. Uh, there was the twenty-first was the day that I was supposed to go to Wichita, right? Um, and the first time that I would have ever been on into Wichita for anything. Uh, and what? I'm sorry. No! You no, know, the thing is, is that I actually like going to places that I've never been before and, you know, going to do events. Like yesterday I was in Pittsburgh and you don't have to say I'm sorry no, there I'm either. Pittsburgh. Yeah. Oh, I see how it is. <laughs> Pro Pittsburgh, anti Wichita. Shame on you, sir. Shame on you. 
This, this anti-Kansas bias disgusts me. I'm sending my small dog, Toto, to shred your ankles. But, but, you know, and so I get, I'm in San Francisco, and I actually get the hotel by the airport so that I can like, get onto the plane. And so we get onto the plane, um, and the plane, every, everything's fine. We're pulling out. They're doing the informational video that you've all seen 80,000 times. And as we're backing out and the information goes out, just everything stops. Like, it goes out. The lights go out. The air conditioning goes out. Oh. And then the pilot comes on the intercom and goes, oh. <laughs> And you're like, that's not good. Like, that's, not, that's not great. And they're like, and so they're like, so is, what is it? It's an all, uh, auxiliary power unit, APU, uh, that, that powers all, everything except the engines, but also starts the engines. So they're like, so we have to turn the plane off and on again. You know, like it's a PC. It's a whole thing. Uh, and so they do, they turn it off and they turn it on again and it runs for five minutes. Then everything goes out again. And then the pilot comes on again and goes, <laughs> And so we are, we are dragged back. We are towed back to the gate and they pile us all out while they figure out what they're going to do, what hamster they need to replace uh, in order to get that thing running. And meanwhile, I'm sitting here going, because it's the only flight that I have that is a connecting flight. All the rest of the flights are direct flights, except for this one in Wichita. And I'm looking at the time, I'm like, uh, 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 and I'm talking to the my to tour and to our travel company uh, about about this. And the problem with Wichita, sir, uh, <laughs> is that not that it's a, you know a terrible place, but that there aren't that many connecting flights to it. So there's one flight that was at 1:41, which was the flight that I was supposed to be on. Um, and then the next flight was at like 10.38 at, at night. So I could go to Wichita, but I would then have no reason to be there because my event, which was supposed to be at six, is now completely over. So we eventually just had to call it and say, we're not going to Wichita this time. We, are, we have rescheduled, I will be there in October. Um, and I hear that Wichita is lovely in October, so <laughs> you know, we'll see what happens. So they're like, okay, get to uh, Denver, and then just fly on to uh, Dallas-Fort Worth, which is where I'm supposed to have my next event. And so I get to Denver, I get on the flight to uh, Dallas-Fort Worth, and guess what? <laughs> we have maintenance issues. <laughs> and the maintenance issues are such that they're like, okay, it'll be another 20 minutes, and then this maintenance issue will be completely cleared up, and then we'll be ready to go, so please don't go anywhere. And then 20 minutes later, uh, well, actually, it's going to be another 20 minutes. And if you want to get off the plane, you can. But don't get off the plane because we will just leave you behind. <laughs> 20 minutes after that, they're like, go ahead and get off the plane. <laughs> 20 minutes after that, you all have to get off the plane. <laughs> and, and they were going to put us on an entirely different plane that is on a different gate. Fortunately, just literally across the, the way. We were at D10. And, the new plane was a D9. They're like, we're going to put you on the D9 plane. We go over and we look at the D9 plane. The nose is off and wires are out. <laughs> so they're like, oh, we're going to put you on that old plane. Right? It's like, what did you do? How did you fix it? Did you use crazy glue and hope? What is going on? Uh, but they did finally get us into Dallas Fort Worth like after midnight. Oh. Right, so I was supposed to have been in Wichita at like three o'clock. It's midnight, uh, and it was just—it was just a whole mess. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna spend the whole day in bed <laughs> eating room service and watching yeah. YouTube. And that is a hundred percent what I did up until the moment that I actually had to go to my bed. <laughs> I was, coming here. <laughs> I, but I came I came here and the flight was perfect. Except it was at 5 30 in the morning because it's the only direct flight from Pittsburgh to RDU. I'm just impressed that there was a direct flight from Pittsburgh to RDU. And they're like, yeah, it's at 5 30. Hey, Suck it. You know? <laughs> And, and so literally, and then my, my flight the day before that was also very early and tomorrow will also be very early. So I've been doing like the thing of really highly segmented sleep where I'm getting like two hours 
at every <laughs> every like three or four hours and stuff like that. And it's giving me the weirdest dreams. <laughs> like I had a dream this morning that I was looking in the mirror and I had Neil Gaiman's hair. <laughs> This is not a joke. It literally was. I was like, and because I, I, I'm a lucid dreamer. I, I mostly know when I'm dreaming. I'm like, what am I doing with Neil's hair? <laughs> what is Neil doing right now? <laughs> Did we swap heads? Because he's bound for disappointment for that. Because you know, eighty percent of Neil, like identifying Neil, is his, you know, his hair, his his floppy. I used to be a bassist for Echo and the Bunnymen hair, right? Uh, and so if he had this poor, you know, excuse for a head, I think he would be just. I think he would be sad. It's like everybody ha have, a, have a have a moment of silence for sad bald bald Neil. You know, uh, uh, He's he's wonderful, but the one the one silver lining um, actually of uh, not making my flight to Wichita was uh, I won an award which is called the Ohio Honor Award. It's one of the state uh, awards of Ohio, strangely enough. Um, and uh, I was nominated for the the I was a finalist for the Fiction Award. Uh, which I looked at who was like nominated with me, like uh, Celeste Ng and uh, Nidhi Okorafor, I believe oh, was, wow. uh, and I was like, well, I'm not gonna win that. <laughs> I'm going to Wichita. Uh, but I did win the uh, Fan Favorite Award, which, you know, which, I love you guys too. <laughs> And, but I couldn't be there, you know. Um, and so Athena, my daughter, actually accepted the award for me. If I had gotten to my event in Wichita, I would not have uh, been able to see this. But uh, because I was in line to go on a plane that was going nowhere, um, I actually got to pull up the streaming thing and, and watch my daughter accept the award for me. And I'm just like, <gasps> <Yeah>. <laughs> the award is actually shaped like Ohio. <laughs> It's hilarious. I mean, I love it. I mean, it's like, you know, I'm sitting there, I was like, what what did, what did you want to do with your life? You know, it's like, well, be a good person, you know, hopefully be a good father and spouse and win an award in the shape of a Midwestern state. <laughs> and, and so it is, it's the shape of Ohio and they've got a base, which is clearly like um, Northern Kentucky. And it's just sort of like, it's like squatting on North and goes, you're our base, Northern Kentucky. <laughs> How do you like that? <laughs> like, well, just trying to protect you. Uh, anyway, hi. I am super wound up. I don't know if that. I don't know what you guys were expecting for this particular event, but this is clearly what I've done. I have, I have wasted 15 minutes complaining about my flights. So, you know, uh, yeah, no, I, I figure you're all right. I do have readings for you, um, uh, and actually, um, well, I have two readings. Um, and then we'll do question and answer, and then we'll do the signings, and then I will be on my way. I feel like, you know, like one of those rock and roll people. It's like, I may not make it back, so love me tonight. And so, <laughs> no, it's like, no, we like you. <laughs> I'm not going to love you. Um, so usually what I do is um, I do the thing where, uh, for the book that's already out, you guys already have it. Um, so I usually make the offers like I could read from you or talk to you about the book that is already out, which I can absolutely do, talk about Spider-Bell and stuff like that. Um, or I can read to you from the book that is going to come out. Oh, oh, yeah. The thing is, is that I always do this and I'm like, and then I put it up to a vote and there's always like two people. It's like, I want to hear about the new book. And then everybody else or, or the, the current book and everybody else is like the new one. Um, but I do want to warn you, the, the if I do read to you from the upcoming book, um, the chapter that I'm going to read to you is, okay, you know, there's like the roller coaster and it goes, it is literally all, it's all set up. <laughs> so it's kind of slow and it's kind of conversational and all of that sort of stuff. It's still cool. It's a good chapter. Otherwise, I wouldn't let you guys read it, you know, or wouldn't read it to you guys. So I, I'm proud of it and everything like that. But I want to manage expectations. There are no, no lasers, no explosions. Uh, literally, there's, you know, uh, there is a cat in it. Um, so there is that. 
Uh, so there is that. And then there is another reading, which I think you will all enjoy. And then, like I said, we'll get to the question and answer. Uh, yes? I think you can probably point at us all at a certain moment in the book, and we'll all shout pew, pew, pew. No. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. That's literally not what I'm going to do. Of all the things that I'm going to do, that's not going to be it. I applaud you for initiative. <laughs> but that's not it. So. So, uh, show of hands, how many want me to read from and or talk about starter villain? Okay. You four in the back. And, and then who wants me to read from the upcoming book? Okay. Well, there we go. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the upcoming book. Uh, actually, I can't tell you too much about it because I don't want to give too much away. But uh, I will say that it is... So I wrote Kaiju Preservation Society, and I wrote Starter Villain, and I, you know, and both of them sort of take place in contemporary time and have really high concept ideas. You know, the Kaiju Preservation Society. What if you had a natural park for the kaiju? You know, Starter Villain. What if you inherited your uncle's uh, villainy business? And so the upcoming book uh, will have the same sort of contemporary time, extremely high concept thing about it. Um, and I don't want to give it too much away, although when I read the chapter, you will figure out what at least part of it is. Um, it's not coming out in 2024, um, and I will tell you why. 2023, that's fine. No. <laughs> Sir, I do not admit to owning a time machine. Do you read the chapter? We yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so what happens is, uh, like for example, this book comes out in September, uh, so the next book will probably is meant to be like a year or so out, right? Um, they, a tour, I don't know if you know, publishes people other than me. Um, <laughs> hard to believe, yeah. but you know, it's not just a, a tiny little imprint. And so they have other people that they need to service as well. Uh, and they we look at when the book that I was writing, uh, that I am writing now, uh, could come out in 2024 and there was and it always they always come out on Tuesdays uh, and one Tuesday was available it was the first Tuesday in November of 2024 <laughs> absolutely the best day yeah, absolutely the best day please register to vote and vote uh, but as but as far as it goes we're like we're looking at that look at we're gonna move that <laughs> so we moved it to uh, February of 2025 uh, the other reason why I'm doing a third book in an extremely loose accidental trilogy of current uh, time major high concept thing is that uh, in the second half of 2025, which by the way is the 20th anniversary of the release of Old Man's War, yeah. there will be the seventh book in the Old Man's War series. Yeah. So we want to make sure that uh, we want to make sure that um, we didn't go back into space with uh, an earlier book. So uh, what I'm saying is, in 2025, your assignment is to buy both of my books. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's not too much to ask for. You can buy other books if you want. But um, anyway, let's. Now that I've burned 20 minutes of just talking, doesn't he ever shut up? No, this is literally where you are. Wait, oh, here's the. Uh, Nobody's quiet. I'm just reading a text from somebody who is literally in the room. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna address that right now. <laughs> it's not wrong, but uh, okay. And that's not it. That's not it. There we go. So here is um, the chapter from the upcoming book that will come out in uh, um, February 2025. Uh, so Cal Nora was the first to see the new moon. You look down, Sean Nora said to his son, who had just arrived home from his day at Spencer Cooperative, Hoboken's finest secular educational institute. <laughs> Today was one of Sean's work from home days. Two days a week, he took the path into the city to sit at a desk and justify his software company's egregious rent in Midtown. <laughs> the rest of the time, he coded from his kitchen table with easy access to coffee and a cat, Mermit, short for murder mittens, <laughs> who would alternately sleep on the table next to Sean's laptop and prop herself up at the window to comment on the pedestrians walking by. 
Well, that is because school sucks, Cal declared, tossing his backpack dramatically onto the bench near the window, startling Mermit, who had been busy having no uncertain opinions about a squirrel running on the fence, hiding the vacant lot across the street. Cal collapsed dramatically onto the bench, clearly exhausted from having to walk the half mile from Spencer Cooperative's middle school campus and home. That is a new record, Sean observed. What does that mean? It means it usually takes you an entire month from the start of the school year to declare that school sucks. This time you're clocking in at two days. <laughs> Dad, eighth grade is different. <laughs> is it, Sean said. I remember you saying that last year and in grades three through six inclusive. <laughs> That's not funny. It's a little funny. <laughs> Look, Cal said, changing from an aggressively lounging position on the bench to lean forward. One, this year we have algebra. Do you know how much algebra sucks? <laughs> I've heard rumors. <laughs> I liked it personally. You liked it because you're a big old computer nerd, Cal waved at Sean's desk set up. You probably use algebra to like code. Never once, actually, Sean said. He reached for his coffee. Two, Dr. Williams won't let me partner with Brian for science projects this year, Cal continued. Sean nodded. That's because Dr. Williams remembers last year when you and Brian did aggressively mediocre work in science because you were too busy sending each other funny memes. We hardly did that. Two parent-teacher conferences with Dr. Williams last year disagree with you. <laughs> Sean drank his coffee, grimacing slightly. It was colder than he remembered it being. Three, Cal said, pressing on. The new humanities teacher is terrible. Sean nodded. And why is that? She wants us to do actual work. <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> Sean got up and went to the kitchen, aiming for the microwave. No, I mean that usually the first week of school is warm up, right? Cal said. You find out what you're doing for the year and you start things off easy. Not Dr. Khalif. She already has given us a major project and we're supposed to have it ready next week. Well, what's the project? We're supposed to do something that connects us to our heritage. Cal made quote marks here with his hands and then presented to the class. I remember doing something like that in 11th grade, Sean said. He popped his coffee mug into the microwave and punched the buttons to warm up his beverage. Everybody showed up with packaged food from their family's nation of origin, mostly cookies. We had an international market near the school. <laughs> well, Dr. Khalif thought of that, Cal said glumly. She ruled out food. She said too many of us have allergies and dietary restrictions. Peanuts are nefarious, Sean agreed. <laughs> so now I have to figure out something else to do. Your life is beset with difficulties. <laughs> I know it, Cal said. He reached over to scratch Mermit for existential consolation. The cat obliged. I was mocking you just then, just so we're clear on that, Sean said. Oh, I know you were, because you're the worst father ever. <laughs> Fair. The microwave ding. Sean retrieved his now a bit warmer coffee. Going back to the original subject, though, this project should be pretty easy for you. Well, how is that? Well, you are Irish and Lebanese and Senegalese and Italian, Sean said. You have a whole lot of heritage going on. Yeah, but we don't do anything with that, Cal said. And for our heritage, Dr. Khalif wants us to use our own family history. Don't let your mom hear you say that you don't do anything with our heritage, Sean warned. She will make you read her doctoral thesis. <laughs> Dr. Isabel Rossi Nora was a professor of global studies at the New School and wrote her thesis on the modern African diaspora, focusing specifically on its impact in northern New Jersey. Cal looked over at Sean. I am not stupid, Dad, he said. But you know what I mean. I know I'm all of those things, but we're not any of those things mostly. Sean sipped his coffee and considered what his son was saying. Cal's genetic history was a curious fact, to be sure. Sean's late father, a radiologist, was a Muslim from Lebanon who had met and married an Irish Catholic nurse from Dublin by way of Boston. Sean had been raised with no particular religion and considered himself apathetic on the matter. Isabel's parents, scions of pri privilege from their respective countries, had met at a Brown University International Students Mixer and Orientation Week, imprinted on each other instantly, and were married before they graduated. They stayed in Rhode Island and raised Isabel to be quintessential American of the wealthy but studious New England variant. Sean and Isabel met at Columbia University. Cal arrived just before her doctoral defense. Genetically, Cal was an obligation of all his genetic lines. Culturally, 
he was just mostly well off North Jersey, <laughs> which generally was not a bad thing. Cal fit in well with all his other equally well off North Jersey friends at Spencer as hoped for and intended, but it did leave him in a bit of a bind right this second. Then it came to Sean. You could find the new moon, he said to Cal. Cal narrowed his eyes at his father. What? No, no, this is good, Sean said. Dad was a Muslim. My dad, your granddad. Not a practicing one. He ate too many bacon cheeseburgers. <laughs> but he loved astronomy, and every once in a while, he'd go find the new moon. I have no idea what that even means. The Muslim calendar is lunar, and they start every month from the moment you can just see the crescent of the new moon in the sky. Cal looked at his father blankly. Lunar cycles, moon phases, Sean said. Come on, kid, why am I paying a ridiculous amount for you to go to that school? I know what moon phases are, Dad, Cal said. I just don't get why anybody would do it that way. Lots of calendars are lunar, the Islamic one, the Jewish one, um, the Chinese one, I think. No, I meant starting it by the second you see the moon. Well, it's complicated, Sean said. In the moment, he was trying to remember what his own dad told him about it when he made the same observation that Cal was making to him now. Spotting it with your eye was the traditional way of doing it. I think now they may have standardized it with computers. I don't think Dr. Khalif is going to accept me looking on Google to find when a computer says the new Islamic month is. No, John agreed. But I bet she will accept that you going to the roof to view it for yourself and tying it to your grandfather's practice and your family's Muslim heritage. We're not Muslim, Cal pointed out, and Grandpa Farouz died before I was born. We're not, but it's part of your story. And maybe this will be a way for you to feel closer to him. You can make that part of your presentation too. Cal considered this. I need to have this done in the next week. Okay, so? So when is the next new moon? Sean looked at his son disapprovingly. <laughs> you don't know? Do you? <laughs> Sean opened his mouth and then closed it again. <laughs> ha! Cal said, a startling Mermit for a second time. Mermit, clearly having enough, hopped down from the bench and headed to a quieter part of the house to nap. Sean sat back down at the kitchen table, put aside his coffee cup, reached for his laptop, and cleared the screen of code he'd been working on to pull up Google. Come over here, he said to his son. You have to do all the typing if you want the school credit. <laughs> Cal groaned and hauled himself up off the bench. Fifteen minutes and several searches later, it was established that the crescent of the new moon would be visible that night, right after sunset, which was supposed to happen at 7.16 p.m. So all you have to do is look west at sunset, Sean said. There are trees blocking the view from the street, Cal pointed out. Go to the roof of the apartment building. I'm not allowed on the roof. I will go with you. You're not allowed on the roof. I won't tell if you don't. <laughs> what if it's cloudy? Sean looked out the window. Should be fine, and if it is, then the month will start on the next day. Seriously? That's what my dad told me. It's probably different now. Sean and Calvin spent the next hour learning about the intricacies of the Muslim lunar calendar, the history of the standardization of, cal of the calendar for global use, whether the Umm al kira calendar, based on the theoretical sighting of the new moon above Mecca, should be adopted by Muslims everywhere, and other such lunar calendrical and theological topics. They were engrossed enough that when Isabel came home from work, they barely acknowledged her. She rolled her eyes and ordered pizza for dinner. At 7.10 p.m., Cal and Sean hiked up to the fire escapes in the back of the brownstone, waving at the neighbors as they passed, and climbed the short ladder that would take them to the roof. The sky was cloudless and the sun hung red just above the horizon. Officially, we're supposed to wait until the sun has set, Sean said. He pulled out his phone, opened it, and went to the app store to buy a planetarium program. The moon will probably be really faint. You should only barely be able to see it. That's why they wait until the sun is just set, so there won't be so much glare. Is that it? Cal said, pointing. Barely above the setting sun, a small blazing dot was visible. Sean glanced up from the circle in the app store, letting him know the status of his download, and followed his son's finger to the dot. Probably not, he said. It's too bright. It's probably Venus or an airplane. That's Venus, Cal said, popping, uh, pointing at another small bright object further away from the sun. Oh, maybe Jupiter then, Sean said. The app finally downloaded. Sean opened it up, allowed it to sample GPS data from the phone while it was active, and then pointed the phone back out in the direction of the setting sun. Huh, he said a second later. It was indeed 
the moon. It's getting brighter, Cal said, a lot brighter. Get out your phone and take a picture, Sean said. You already have your phone out. You have a school project. <laughs> Cal grunted at the truthfulness of this fact and got out of his phone to start snapping photos. Sean did the same as the extremely bright dot began to flatten and take on a crescent form. Sean zoomed in as far as his camera would allow and snapped a bunch of photos in succession. Will this count? Cal asked. We spotted the moon before the sun set. Probably, Sean said. The moon will absolutely be visible after the sun sets. Good, Cal said. If I turn in the project early, maybe I'll get extra credit. That's the spirit. <laughs> Sean was distracted by the moon. He remembered the times as a child when his father, pointing at the horizon, would show him the pale and almost invisible crescent of the moon, barely above the line of the earth. It would be so hard to see that more than once he was convinced his dad was just playing with him, pretending to see it so he could make Sean say he saw it too. There was no missing this crescent. It was brighter than anything else in the sky except in the sun itself, its top limb now only barely visible above the horizon. Then it was gone, and only the moon remained, hovering like an incandescent spaceship. Sean snapped one more picture and then on impulse attached it to an email and sent it to Martin Abernathy, his friend and former Columbia dorm mate who got his degree in astronomy and was now a deputy division director at the National Science Foundation. <laughs> What's going on with the moon, he wrote. I've never seen it like this. He sent the email and immediately felt better for it. Marty would email him back and tell him it was just closer in its orbit or something and then give him crap for only sending him an email when he had a science question he wanted answered. <laughs> Which was true. It was the only time Sean emailed him. Facebook updates handled most other things. <laughs> Dad, Cal said. Sean snapped back to attention. Sorry, what? I asked if we could go down now. The moon is setting and I want pizza. Sean looked and saw the weirdly big and bright moon being swallowed by the rotation of the planet. Sure, he said to Cal. We're not supposed to be up here anyway. Did you get enough pictures for your project? Cal shrugged. Now that his project problems were solved, he'd lost interest in it, probably because now came the boring part, typing it all up and making an actual presentation. Sean could sympathize. Typing things up was always the boring part for him, too. So naturally, he became a software programmer, <laughs> where everything he did was typing. Hey, Dad, Cal said as they walked down the fire exits, waving again to their increasingly confused neighbors. Yeah? Happy new month. Thanks, Cal. Any plans for it? Pizza, Cal said. <laughs> Pizza, Sean agreed. A good start. I guess we'll see what goes from here. There you go. That's that. Right. So you know that something's going on with the moon, but what? <laughs> Find out. February 2025. <laughs> It seems almost cruel to do that to you. It makes me feel warm inside. I don't know, did you read from the first chapter or the eighth chapter? No, just you wait. Uh, <laughs> All right. Okay, so I'm going to read to you the second thing, which requires a little bit of a story to tell because, of course, it does because I'm me. Um, so how many of you know what the Joko Cruise is? All right, a fair number of you. For those of you who don't, there's a cruise that I go on every year, and it's sort of a nerd-themed cruise. It's uh, named after Jonathan Colton, who is a nerd musician who writes songs about homicidal computers, uh, computer programmers, uh, and zombies, like you do. Um, lots of fun. They've been doing this for, I think, 12 or 13 years now, and I've been a part of it for more than a decade. Um, and it's not just Joko and his musician friends. It's also comedians, it's scientists, it's writers, I'm having the lid track there, um, and other folks who are kind of nerdy and cool to have at an event. Um, so I was gonna go on to the cruise this year, and I realized I needed new sandals because like literally all my sandals were from 1987 and were just, they were a biological hazard. Um, so I, I got a pair of Crocs because my daughter had gotten a pair of Crocs, which I roundly mocked her for, but then I needed to take the dog out and I just slipped them on to go outside. I'm like, these, these are comfortable. <laughs> uh, and I was, and so I was like, they will be perfect for a boat because, you know, there's water, you know, and they'll clear right out and they're comfortable and all that sort of stuff. So I bought a pair and they were just like brilliant lime green, right? Because if you're going to go 
you got to dip your toe in the croc lifestyle. you got to go the whole way, right? Oh, the football for that. Yeah, no, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to argue that point right now. I'm trying to tell the story here. <laughs> so I'm on the cruise, and I'm uh, about to do a panel with Will Wheaton uh, and a couple of other friends. And I go up to the stage to, you know, do this panel, and Will looks at my shoes and just like, you disgust me. <laughs> Why are you wearing those things? I thought you were cool, you know. And then the then the panel starts, and Will still is giving me crap about my shoes, uh, you know. And then everybody else on the panel sort of piles on as well, you know. And finally, I just snap, and I'm like, "Screw you, Will Wheaton! <laughs> I'm going to write a story, and it's going to be called Will Wheaton Croc Hunter." <laughs> And you are going to die at the hands of Crocs. And he said, well, screw you, John Scalzi. I am going to write a story called Will Wheaton Croc Hunter, where you die at the hands of Crocs. And so we retired that evening to our respective cabins and wrote short stories called Will Wheaton Croc Hunter. And I read mine that Tuesday. Uh, and he, Will didn't come to my event because he did not want to be tainted by my vision of his horrible death at the hand of Crux. Uh, and then his event was on Thursday, and I went to his uh, so that I could hear how I died because I wanted to know. Um, and they're very different stories told in very different ways. But one thing that was really interesting is despite the fact that they were written in isolation without one, either of us knowing about the other one's story, um, they both landed on the exact same climactic sentence. <laughs> you will know it when you hear it. So, you know, so of course, the, the story of Will and my croc war went viral on the cruise ship, which is a horrible metaphor. <laughs> uh, and people were super, super excited about it. It's like, oh, it's gonna be great. There's gonna be a you know battle between Will and John. And I was just like, really, that battle would be like, ah. <laughs> but one of the funny things that happened is we landed on Tortola, uh, which is an island in the Caribbean, and they had a croc store there. <laughs> and it was like a plague of locusts just descended on this thing. And they're like, because all of a sudden like, people are like, oh, look, a croc store. <laughs> You know, taking the pictures and doing all that sort of stuff. And we wiped that place out and they were like, what the is going on? Like literally it was like, you know, January, February, March. They literally had no idea what was going on. And then people came back onto the cruise after being in the tutorial and they would run up to me, look, look, I got Crocs just like you. We're Croc buddies now. And I'm like, yay. And somebody bought Will a little baby pair of Crocs. And they're, like, oh. they're like, they're so cute. Look, how can you get them? And like, no. <laughs> so it became a whole thing, and it was hilarious, and uh, we had a good time. Uh, and this is my long way of saying that I'm now going to read to you Will Wheaton Croc Hunter. <laughs> and to uh, make it particularly exciting, I will read it in a highly Shatner-esque fashion. Oh, dear. oh, you know, it's too late. It's too late. You bought your ticket. You're going on the ride. Remember I was going, here comes a, ah! Right. Yes, it's too late now. All right, Will we in Crock Hunter? The exterior portal to the light speed capable skit irised open to an atmosphere of a dark and mysterious new world and from its interior, a man, a hard man, a man filled with resolve stepped out. In his hand was a multi-weapon equipped with rifle, shotgun, grenade launcher, and flamethrower. In his heart was bitter hatred. <laughs> hatred for a thing, a thing that robbed him of friends, of loved ones, and some would say the better part of his life. Finally, he said, it ends here. And with those fateful words, Wilbert Will Wheaton, <laughs> captain of the Star Patrol Corps, stepped heavily booted foot on Kappa Rho Omega Kappa, 
the planet of the crotch. <laughs> there is no planet of the crotch, Will was told time and again by friends, by colleagues, by superiors, and by a series of increasingly frustrated therapists. <laughs> Those popular and easy to wear sandals are made here on earth, mostly in Vietnam. That's what they want you to think, Will had replied. The insidiousness of crotch started with this very element, the cover story about their origin. Of course, those who had been taken over by the Crocs would tell you that their starting point was local and innocuous. It made it easy for the Crocs to procure more victims, first innocent patsies, but then willing, complicit accomplices in the Crocs' nefarious scheme. Will knew the Crocs had to be alien in origin. Spectral analysis of their soft, rubberized material strongly suggested that its components were compounds and molecules not easily found on Will's home planet, not in the amounts that would allow the crocs to propagate in such massive numbers as they had, to find as many feet as they did in the horribly short time since they first appeared in Will's consciousness. <laughs> as he trudged through the difficult terrain that tore at his space fabric and star boots, Will recalled the first time he had seen a pair of Crocs on the feet of a fellow Star Patrol Corps person in the locker room of the Star Patrol precinct. What the hell are those horrible things? Will had exclaimed, alarmed by the oddly shaped yet compellingly squishy footwear. <laughs> They're called Crocs, his colleague said. They look like you stepped in gum and kept stepping in it, Will said. <laughs> I know they look a little silly, his friend, his colleague admitted, but they feel great. You should try a pair. It will be a cold day in hell before I put those on my feet, Will replied. It's cold now, Will thought to himself as he trudged across the desolate landscape of the crop planet, his boots rated for maximum resiliency, beginning to develop stress, tears, and holes. The crop planet was frigid and inhospitable to life, a reason, perhaps, why the things sought so desperately to find kinder, more hospitable climes. Like Earth, he said aloud, and the words were ripped from his lips by a howling wind that drove Will toward his destination as surely as his own steel toe determination. Earth, warm and inviting, was the perfect place for the crocs to propagate, which is why they were suddenly everywhere there. From the first pair in the Star Patrol locker room, Will started seeing more pairs appear on the feet of other Star Patrol Corps people, then on the feet of civilians, and then finally, terrifyingly, on the feet of children. <laughs> Little children, he had exclaimed to his wife, they're just sandals, she replied. And anyway, I think they're kind of cute. They are not cute. Will growled. They look like an industrial accident got slipped over your toes. <laughs> well, maybe you'll change your mind, Will's wife said, and placed a box on the table they were sitting at. <laughs> Will gaped at the box in horror. You didn't. He hissed at his wife. Oh, don't be so dramatic, she said back at him. They're perfectly functional open-backed footwear, and they were on sale. <laughs> On sale, Will whispered. Yes, a two-for-one sale, his wife replied. In horror, Will looked below the table. Beneath it, his wife's feet were clad in Crocs. <laughs> Pink ones. <laughs> I got yours in your favorite color, his wife said, chuckling an earthly chuckle at Will felt to the very soles of his feet. On the planet of the Crocs, Will screamed at the memory and at the pain in his feet. His boots, shredded by the landscape, had nevertheless taken him to his destination, a wide, echoing cave that his source told him was the lair of the ultimate Crocs, the parents of the entire nation of pillowy, foot-encasing creatures that had now infested and conquered Will's home planet and beyond. <laughs> and you're sure about this, Will had demanded of his source. This is how to end our unceasing plague. Yes, yes, his source said, pressing the coordinates of Kappa Rho Omega Kappa and the cave of the Urcrax into Will's hand. Find the parent crocs, bathe them in purifying fire. They are the source, end them, end the scourge. How do you know this, Will said. I have always known it, his source said, but no one would believe me until you. You are the one to end this invasion and save humanity. How do I know it's not a trick and the crocs haven't gotten to you? 
uh, Will demanded. I took measures, his source cackled, and lifted his pant legs to reveal shoeless stumps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it got a little dark there. <laughs> Will turned on his flashlight and plunged barefoot and limping into the cave. This mission, he knew, represented the end of his career. Denied permission from Star Patrol to seek out the croc planet and destroy the parent crocs, he had stolen the starcraft he needed to take him there. If he was lucky, he would only be court-martialed and dishonorably discharged. More likely, he would spend the next decade or two in a Star Patrol prison. He was ready for such a fate, if one befell him, in no small part because he knew the prison apparel included non-croc footwear. <laughs> there they are, Will breathed as he turned the corner in the cave and saw the Ur-Crocs, the parents of all other Crocs. They rested on a raised dais, illuminated by a single shaft of light that flickered as clouds high above scuttered in the sky. They were golden and sparkly, and the shaft of life caused the glitter embedded in the skin of these primal crocs to wink invitingly, mockingly, at Will. Will did not hesitate. He enabled his flamethrower and prepared to toast these crocs into their next life. See you in hell, crocs, he said triumphantly, and raised his flamethrower to end their reign. And then, almost by accident, he looked up and saw the ceiling of the cave covered, nay, festooned with crocs, thousands of them of all colors and sizes waiting there for him. <laughs> oh no, Will said, realizing the trap that had been set for him as the first of the crocs detached from the ceiling to fall on him. Will ran back toward the entrance of the cave, but an avalanche of crocs fell there blocking his escape. He dodged this ceaseless rubberized rain, but sheer numbers and gravity were not on his sight. Lightweight though they were, there were still too many. Struck again and again, Will was driven finally and surely to the ground, flat on his back, staring up at the storm of crocs that would not end. It was in this position that a pair of crocs fell from the ceiling, landing on Will's bare and bloody feet. My God, Will thought in his last moment of consciousness, these things are really comfortable. <laughs> And then there was nothing but silence and a burial mound of footwear. <laughs> so as a, as a coda to the story, Will did not actually hear the story and did not read the story. I sent it to him, but he didn't. Um, read it. Um, <laughs> he claims he lost the email. Um, and so, Actually, a few weeks later, he was the uh, guest of honor at the Southern Kentucky Boat Festival um, that I was also going to be attending. Um, and it was actually kind of interesting because the, I got this like uh, email from uh, the, the book festival. They're like, hey, you're going to be here. You're friends with Will. I'm like, yeah. And they're like, could you like, you know, hang around with him, make sure that everything's OK with him? And I'm like, so this is kind of like when we're at the zoo and you have a cheetah and it's nervous so you give him a golden retriever right <laughs> will's the cheetah and i'm the golden retriever and they're like yeah you know i told will my golden retriever theory and found it quite amusing um but we were in his uh we were in his suite at the at the hotel there um eating dinner which was actually like uh fettuccine carbonara that we didn't get utensils given to us for, so we were literally eating it with our hands. Um, and we were just talking about the the idea that we actually take our stories and bundle them together and do some sort of charitable thing with them, which we still kind of have plans to, but apparently we have to like talk with Crocs because there are things like trademarks, intellectual property, and not getting sued, uh, and all that sort of stuff. But I was like, did you, because I heard his story, which was great, and I was like, have you heard my story and he's like no and i was like so i'm there phone in one hand fettuccine carbonara in the other 
reading him this story, you know, it's like a mad performance by Will about how I murdered him with a cross. <laughs> All right, we have a little bit of time before we get to the, the signing portion of things. And so I wanted to, uh, if, it, if people had questions, to do a little quick question and answer thing. Um, the rules for question and answer are uh, raise your hand, like it's kindergarten, um, questions in the form of a question. Uh, all questions are one part questions. Um, and I used to say questions should be about tweet link, but we don't talk about that site anymore. <laughs> it's so sad. Yeah. It's so yeah. sad. Yeah, we, we can talk about that later. Uh, but keep them as short as possible. And the idea is so that we can get to as many questions as we can during what is actually going to be a fairly, I'm out of 10, 15 minute uh, Q&A session, because then we have to get the sign in and then you don't have to get out. So uh, if you have questions, just raise your hand. Uh, we'll start here, and then we'll go here and here. Yes? Do you ever think about doing one of these events in Bradford at the church? Do I ever think about doing one of these things at, in Bradford at the church? Well, it holds 7,000 people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, uh, I own a church, <laughs> which seems like a terrible idea. <laughs> Science fiction author, religion, yeah. bad mix. Um, <laughs> but we bought it for office because we wanted office space and because we wanted to uh, have some uh, room for um, you know just business related things and we were just going to buy a uh, like some land and build a pole barn but then the church went up for sale like literally that morning for uh, you know and we knew where the church was we went past it every day my wife and I went to go see it her job is insurance claims adjuster she has certificates in appraising houses so she was literally crawling through the walls right <laughs> uh, and she comes out of it and she's like this is amazing it needs work and it did we had to replace the roof we had to replace the electricity because it's not in the tube you know all of that sort of stuff but she's like but we should get it you know simply because among other things it, they were letting it go for a ridiculous price like I what I love to do is to show people uh, who live on either coasts the house <laughs> or, or the church just this huge beautiful edifice and be like guess how much it costs <laughs> and yeah no don't look at don't don't spoil it but you know it's the thing of uh and they start it like oh it's got to be clearly like a million dollars or something like that and i'm like nope lower and they keep going down and down and the lower it goes the angrier they go. <laughs> so it finally hit the actual price which is how much is it $75,000 oh. and then you can just see them like just I have to leave the room <laughs> so so now we have the church it's now actually we completed the renovations we're going to do the moving and all that sort of stuff in fact one of the things that we do have is we have the um, we have the sanctuary area uh, it's been refurbished we pulled out the 50-year-old industri green industrial carpet and so the, the hardwood cut uh, underneath and we did it and stuff like that. And one of the things that we actually are going to do is uh, hopefully um, every couple of months where we will have uh, an event where musicians come in or, or have people come read and stuff and open it up to the community. And the reason that you would do that is this is a church where people went to Sunday school, where they, where they prayed, where they got married, where they had funerals. And it would be, we're going to use it for our business ends and everything else like that, but it would be wrong of us to completely remove it from the community entirely. So we will be doing events. So yes, I will probably at some point do a reading there. Um, I mean, I don't know if they actually, there's a whole lot of people in Bradford who read me, you know, and that's, that's not a denigration of them, but I'm just like, I'm just John from down the road, right? I'm like, oh, it's Athena's dad. I am Athena's dad more than I am anything else. Uh, you have a question. Yeah, I, I was wondering, um, do you agree with the truism that there's a problem with uh, prejudice against comedy and science fiction because that you, you do it very well and I thank you for it but why why is that so the question is 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 there a prejudice against comedy and do I think it is there has been um, I will say this uh, when I sold old man's war to tour and they were like do you have anything else and I was like well I had agents of the stars um, which was the first thing I ever wrote which was mostly funny and they're like no we don't want that because they're like humor doesn't sell well in science fiction 
Um, and so I wrote, um, and so I, instead I sold them uh, The Android's Dream, which starts off with a chapter of somebody farting somebody else to death. So, <laughs> smart move there, Tor. Um, and of course they eventually released Agents of the Stars. The thing was, I do have a theory about this, which was in 1977 or 78, um, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy got uh, released. And it is the funniest damn book. I mean, I remember being 12 years old in the back of my friend's mom's car trying desperately not to pee myself because I was laughing so hard at this book. I succeeded. Um, it's very important that you know that. Uh, but it was close, right? Because I didn't stop reading it. Um, but the thing is, is that the um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is British farce. Douglas Adams, aside from Neil Innes, is the only person besides the Monty Python crew to have a credit for a Monty Python skit. He is a trained British farcist before he started writing science fiction. Other people started trying to write comedy in science fiction and it had made such an impact. It was just like a extinction event for any other form of humor um, that everybody tried to write British farce. And unless you're a trained British farcist that you went to Cambridge and like majored in farcism, uh, <laughs> you were going to do very badly with it. So there was a lot of really bad humor, enough so that it kind of like crushed the market. Um, it took eight books or 10 books, well, however many books, between like Old Man's War and Red Shirts that we were finally able to like say Red Shirts, it's a funny book, right? It's meant to be funny. All my stuff had humor in it, they just never marketed it that way, right? Um, and then when Red Shirts took off and won a whole bunch of awards, including Hugo, it went from nobody can write humor in science fiction to nobody can write humor in science fiction like Stolz, which again was horribly untrue. Now we are at the point where I don't think there is a bias against comedy anymore because enough people are writing comedy in science fiction that it's not a, a, a mark of, of shame or doom or anything else. Um, so I think we are over that now, but it was a, it was a very long time. Um, and it's, you know, the simple fact of the matter is that humor is hard, right? People think it's not hard because it, because everybody makes jokes to their friends and stuff like that. Um, and it feels light. You know, and every once in a while I do get the thing where people are like, well, what's Scalzi doing? He's just doing like, you know, it's not that hard what Scalzi does. And I was like, okay, do it. <laughs> go ahead. Just do it. I dare you. I double dare you. It's not that, you know, because I'm not, I'm not threatened by anybody else doing it. I'm just like saying there's a lot going on. It is harder and it's harder to write comedy than it is drama because like the failure mode of drama is if it's at 100%, it hits 100%, you're weeping and you're sobbing. If it's at 80%, you have a tear. If it's at 60%, you have a lump in your throat. And if it's at 40%, you're like, well, that sucks. You know, <laughs> but it fails gracefully. Whereas humor is hugely idiosyncratic. You either think it's funny, in which case it's hilarious, or you don't think it's funny, in which case you're angry at the author for wasting your time. <laughs> it's an on-off switch. I mean, there is some gradation, but it is, and it, and it feels personal, and everybody's sense of humor is so idiosyncratic, right? So it's, it's harder to write humor and have it land. Like, uh, Red Shirts has the most five star and one star reviews of anything that I've ever written. You know, it's like the, the Kirkus review for Red Shirts and the Publishers Weekly review for Red Shirts are both like, this is horrible. Who told this guy he was funny? You know, and I definitely don't hold it against both of those places. <laughs> but, but, you know, but that was the whole thing. That sense of humor didn't work for them. So humor is back in science fiction. It's doing very well. We have a, lot, a number of practitioners who do a really good job of it. Um, I, and I'm happy that it is because it's always should be there. You had a question here, and then we'll do a couple more. Okay, uh, in Starter Villain, why Bellagio? Why did you choose that side? The question was, in Starter Villain, uh, there's uh, why Bellagio, which is a commune in Italy. Uh, 
partly because it's where rich people go. It's where rich people go, and I needed a place where rich people go, and I didn't want it to be in North America. I wanted to be to be redolent of old European money because the league of evil that is in that book it was primarily uh, European, at least when it started off, because it it traces itself back, as the book says, to the Boer War. This is not a spoiler. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and nobody nobody in North America like knows what the Boer War is. Not you guys, I'm sure a lot of you are like, now wait a minute, I know about both Boer Wars. <laughs> Most people. <laughs> Nerds. Um, so uh, so as far as it goes, that was, that was kind of the place. And also, just because it's beautiful, you know, and you want to be able to set the scene and do all of that sort of stuff, and you want places to have kind of interesting locales, you know. Um, you know, and this book hops from Barrington, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago, um, to, you know, St. Genevieve, which is an island down by Grenada, to, you know, this place in Italy, and it's just beautiful. And it's really funny because the place does exist. Um, the hotel I'm thinking of exists, although I changed the name. You know, and I literally use Google Maps to walk around and find all of the places. You know, no, this is what you do, right? I can't. I, I mean, tour is tour is not going to allow me to expense a trip to Bellagio, Italy. They they love me, but they don't love me that much. So uh, anyway, that's the way I see it. Questions? Questions over here? Yes, yes, in the tie dye shirt. I, I can't read you Will's version for, for two reasons. One, um, I don't have it with me. Um, and the second thing is it's Will's. It is up for Will to decide when and how he wants to have it released into the world. Like I said, we are still thinking about doing some sort of charity bundle with it. And what I think would actually be awesome is if I read his story and he read mine, you know, an, an audiobook sort of thing. That would be kind of fun to do. Um, but... Uh, since it's his, uh, I can't say. I will say that it was kind of cyberpunkish, um, that it took place in LA. It had a lot of music from the 80s in it. Uh, <laughs> weirdly, <laughs> who would have thought? Uh, and that, and that I die horribly. I mean, not just a little bit. It's pretty, pretty awful. Um, let's take a question from back here uh, in the second half of the thing. Does anybody have a question back there? Yes, all the way in the back. My process for writing dialogue. Um, so to begin with, um, I think that authors often get kind of things for free. There are things that are that are easier for them to do uh, than other things. Like one thing I don't get for free is description. I almost never write description because I find it boring and I'm not good at it. Uh, another thing that I'm not good at, um, which is why you never find it in my books, erotica. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, that would be hilarious. Like, yes, but that's not what erotic is for. <laughs> you don't want it to be like, oh, scalding. You call it hot scalding? Yeah. Look, look at you. Look at you, Trump, talking about tumescent things. <laughs> What's really hilarious is that for for at least a couple of years there was a rumor going on that I was that I was Chuck Tingle, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so you are saying that the straightest, most cis guy that exists. I mean, look at this face. I mean, that he is the guy that is writing. Chuck Tingle's fantasies involving, you know, sentient, yeah, sentient uh, jets and everything else, and 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 it's queer as all get out. I'm like, bless your heart. I am so glad that you think I have such range in me. But that ain't me, folks. That's just that's just not. So. Um, so those things are things I don't get for free, but the things that I do get are, are, are humor and dialogue, but those are easy for me to do, which doesn't mean that I don't have to work for them, but those are the modes that I am comfortable with. The thing that I do when I do uh, dialogue is I first 
um, understand that dialogue is not actually speech, it's exposition disguised as speech that moves the, uh, moves the story forward. Um, and so you work at, the first pass of it is that you make it sound as much as you can like people are speaking. Um, then the second thing that you do is you read it out loud. Because if you don't, if you read it out loud and you run out of breath or you trip over your words or you do any of that sort of stuff, then it doesn't feel like dialogue. It feels like writing with quotation marks around it. And this is more important than people think. There are a lot of writers, and I'm not going to name names because that would be uh, bad of me, but there are a lot of writers who write dialogue that sounds like it's typed. Um, because they don't read it out loud, they don't have that back and forth, uh, and try to make it sound like people actually actually speak. Um, and those things are actually really uh, kind of important. And then the third thing I do is I give it to my wife to read. Um, Chrissy is my, my beta reader, and um, she loves me too much to be nice to me. <laughs> and so she will let me know if that dialogue works. So it is useful, actually, if you can, to have somebody you trust uh, uh, to uh, point out if something's not working, not just dialogue, but dialogue is something she pays attention to as well. All right, uh, one more question, and then we go to the signing. Um, what are you reading now? What am I reading right now? Nothing much because I'm writing a new novel and I don't tend to read uh, while I'm writing novels because then other people's modes of writing leak out of my fingertips. Um, <laughs> mixed with my own and usually that's terrible um there was one time i was writing i can't forget i can't remember which book it was i was writing but i was uh reading china mieville oh. and china mieville and i do not write the same oh no it was collapsing empire um and so like i was writing that and i was like it's coming out of my fingers right and it was my brain trying to write like china mieville and i'm like stop that Stop it. I mean, I love China's writing. It's wonderful, but it, nothing like mine. And so I had to like, I literally had to write that 3,000 words to get China out of my system, which, you know, sounds so much hotter. <laughs> Speaking of erotica, than it, than, it, uh, than it actually was. But, you know, so uh, prior to that, I was actually, I don't know if you guys know, um, and it may come as a surprise to some of you, um, the um, Kaiju Preservation Society is a finalist for the Hugo this year. Yeah. Um, and so that was my opportunity to read some of the other Hugo finalists. So I'd already read The Spare Man, uh, which was by Mary Robinette Cole, which is terrific. Um, and that, that I read uh, the Travis Baldry book, which is Legends and Latte, um, which is your D and D, you know, your D and D campaign decides to open up a Starbucks, you know, which is great. Um, you know, the Daughter of Dr. Moreau by Sylvia Moreno Garcia, uh, which is fabulous. Um, Note of the Ninth, which is uh, which is Tamsin Muir, which continues the the tradition of the ninth you know the ninth series which is what the hell am i reading and why can't i stop um and then uh tk kingfisher's book um you know she uh, uh, otherwise known as ursula vernon um and they're all terrific and which is exactly what you want when you are a finalist with uh for an award you want the other books to be really good too so that if you win you can be like, I won uh, in a really good field of people. And if you lose, you're like, well, of course I lost. I mean, that book was terrific, right? <laughs> so either way, you're, you're kind of covered. I do think that what's interesting about the Hugos this year um, is that the books are, relatively speaking, lighter um, than a lot of years where they have, uh, you know, books with darker themes and, and so on and so forth. Um, and when, they, when the uh, thing was, when the uh, were announced, I was like, w I was wondering why that was. I mean, I was happy. I wasn't expecting uh, Kaiser to get nominated for anything, and apparently I was wrong in a big way because it won <laughs> the Locus and it won an Alex Award and it won the Ohio Honor Award and it's up for this, and it, it got nominated for a Dragon Award too. So you know, it did okay. But I was like, what what happened? And I think the thing that happened was we spent two plus years just being in a hole. Yeah. Right? Uh, just, it was dark, it was unhappy, all of that sort of stuff. And then uh, came some books, Kaiju, Spare Man, uh, the um, Legends and Latte for sure, 
where it was just like they're extremely well written and they made you feel good and you had good and proper escapism from them and people were so happy just to get out of their own heads that when it came time to to nominate things um, the things that gave them joy this year were the things that they that they ended up nominating um, and so when I think people look back at this year they're going to be like yep that was the year where people was like I don't want to think about dark stuff yeah. <laughs> give me big monsters <laughs> and dnd campaigns <laughs> and pastiches of 30 screwball comedies and then that's the uh, way it goes so um it's a good year is what i'm saying go ahead and read them you're going to really enjoy them if you're voting i don't uh, I don't envy you because it's going to be very difficult. I mean, I'm going to vote for me. Um, <laughs> but uh, but as far as it goes, uh, whoever wins is going to be it's going to be uh, a, a well deserved win. So, all right, folks. One, thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate you coming on a Sunday. Um, and then uh, we are going to someone else will explain to you how I'm, we're going to do the signing. Uh, just so you know that while I'm signing. Um, I'm going to wear a mask because I have been in front of literally hundreds of people and I have a few more people not to mention Budapest uh, in my future so uh, I don't want to accidentally infect any of you uh, just in case I picked anything up. I've been vaccinated so it's been fine but uh, if you want to take pictures I will take my mask down for the pictures but otherwise I'll be wearing it as I sign I hope you understand that um, so anyway tell